Okay, awesome. Recording has started. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brendan Miranda. I am the research ad re graduate student advisor for LCS, Latinx in Computer Science. Today, our guest speaker is Jamie Potter. Jamie will be talking to us about um, how to write a amazing SOP. Um, the, the format of the inter of the talk is going to be sort of a podcast format. So people, viewers and um, subscribers, our group and stuff like that submitted questions before the talk. We'll go through them. And after that, um, we plan to go questions live. Um, also feel free to interject and make it, you know, ask questions if you want. And just a little bit of background on Jamie. I met Jamie through Quora. He helped me get into a PhD program. Um, UIUC is top five in CS, so it was all thanks to Jamie. <laughs> just kidding, yeah, just kidding. But he definitely helped. Um, Jamie study is an expert in studying organizations. He has a PhD in organizational behavior from Warden School. He has spent a lot of time giving advice on SOPs. He's, he's an amazing writer in Quora. If you are not following him and reading his advice after this talk, I recommend you to to go and do that. It's very, very good advice. Jamie is a really good writer. I have learned that writing is really hard, so I really appreciate his skills. So we're fortunate to have him. Welcome, Jamie, and let's start. Cool. Awesome. So let's start with the questions. So the first, so I'm just going to go sort of through them as I receive them. People can ask more clarifying things if they want to. So this is the, um, the first question. The first question is, what are some ways to make my statement of purpose stand out without coming off as overly informal or superficial? Yeah, so it's interesting, but if you're trying to make it stand out, I'm trying to draw the connection there between how, if you make it stand out, why it's more informal. Because um, the way I view it as the way you make it stand out is you don't apply to schools for a PhD as much as you apply to professors. So like, while it's cool to go to an Ivy League or want to go to Harvard, really, you should be applying based on a specific research interest. It's far, far different. And it's a theme I'll keep coming back to. Far different than an undergrad statement of purpose or where you're just saying like, I want to go to this great school because that looks good. And then I can do a bunch of things afterwards, right? You are applying to a specific professor in many cases, not even a a school, but if the best professor in the world for a topic is at, you know, Arizona Northern University, you know, you'd want to go there and apply directly with that professor. So in a statement of purpose, the best way you can make it stand out is to read. I mean, what I did, it's a bit extreme, but the professor I wanted to work with, I read every one of her papers, I, probably twice, I skimmed it a second time, and wrote my statement specifically to her. And what you're saying in that statement is, for one, you're showing, I understand. I've read your research. I'm interested in it. I understand your body of research. Here's where I think it could go in the future and where it should go in the future. And you actually get a lot of hints from that in their recent work, kind of where it's shifted to. Also in more recent papers, there's a, at least in my field, a future directions area of research where I'm looking to go in the future. So you have a lot of hints there. So in your statement of purpose, you're saying, Here's where I think we should study together over the next five years. And here's how I can help you. Again, so it's structured very differently than an undergrad statement of purpose where you're just saying, hey, I'm so smart. I took all these hard classes. I did well in the SAT. That's kind of irrelevant here. What's far more relevant is I read your research. I know where you're going. Here's where we should go together. And here's how I can help you. And so it's, it's not helpful to say, you know, I did really well. I got an A in this class. What's more helpful is to say, I have these skills. I have these computing skills. I know R and Python. I've been using them for years in my coursework. So the focus is on the skills that will help you and this professor move the research forward over the years to come. Yeah. Great. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to tack on a question that isn't there, but related to this, because it seems natural. Um, so I, oh, I missed it. Sorry. It just, I just let, it just went away from my head. Sorry about that. But um, I'm just going to comment on the informal thing. I, I don't think you should, I don't know. You should always be formal in these sort of applications. 
Um, no, I, I, do you agree with that, Jamie? Like writing, doing your best writing? I mean, yeah, sure. But I mean, no, I think more no importantly- need, Yeah, no need to be bombastic, but no need to yeah. write the word cool, <laughs> for example. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think you try to keep it formal, but yeah, if you're just talking about the research, yeah, I, I, I think it's okay to, yeah, you shouldn't use like emojis or a bunch of acronyms or things like that. Uh, so, but you know, you can talk about the research. It doesn't have to be this very structured thing in my view. It just has to show the professor who's reading it. Wow, this person knows my research because that's what their life's work is. You have to keep that in mind. They get very excited because they read, you know, 50 statements of purpose. And a lot of them read like undergrad ones where it's like, I'm really smart. I did well in school. And what they care about is their research and how someone's going to help them move it forward. That is what a PhD program is. So they get really excited in whatever format it is. If they go, whoa, this person has read my work. They know what my body of work is. And they're giving me new ideas for how to take it forward. That gets a professor, no matter who or no matter where this statement of purpose is from in the world, that gets them excited because it's their life's work. So they're very excited to see people know about it and have proposed ways to move it forward. Yeah. Yeah. In my, in my own experience, I can maybe mention how I did my statement a little bit too. Um, I think that is, Jamie's totally right. I think if you are like me and are really interested in staying in academia or continue to do research, they, there's a saying that is publish or perish. So it's a sort of a joke. I don't think it's very good in the sense. It's true and false. You know, people obviously, basically what I'm trying to say is that research and moving the field forward is what researchers want the most, you know? So that is what you should focus on. Um, I took a similar strategy, a little different in the sense that I already had a topic I really, really wanted to study and not that many people were doing it ex directly. So I definitely try to pitch why it was very important. And I was always trying to talk to connect how what I'm thinking about is related to their work and why it's fantastic. Um, I definitely went through every page of a professor that in the department and I tried to made it, I obviously didn't have the time to, you know, tailor it perfectly for everyone, but you should definitely, if you can, that is definitely worthwhile. Do you agree, Jamie? Yeah, and to that point, I was gonna add on exactly to that is, the kind of gold standard for a statement of purpose is, yes, I want to work with this one professor specifically, but you shouldn't just write about them because what if they leave the school, right? Then there's nothing for you there. It should, a statement should touch on maybe two or three professors, I think at most in the department. And the gold standard is if you can somehow triangulate their research, you have one, two, three professors. This is your primary one. Here's how I want to bring his or her research forward. Oh, and actually it sort of intersects with Professor Y and Professor Z's research. So I could see sort of bringing us together in the department and professors again, get excited about that because departments are linked up and maybe they haven't worked with every other professor in the department. So that shows you're gonna be a really strong fit and you're gonna be a robust person in the department in that if one professor leaves, you still have others that you can work with and that will support you which leads into, right, kind of later down the road, you need a dissertation committee. So you will definitely need at least three people who very much support your candidacy and want you at the school. So if you can show that you're thinking about that and aware of that in your statement of purpose, you're, you're way ahead of the game. Great. And do you think um, just because you asked if master's is different? In my experience, you know, professors are, want research. So in my intuition tells me that a master's SOP, I don't know if that exists, should be pretty similar to a PhD, no? Is that correct? I guess I don't really know. If you want to stay in research or want to work in industry, right? Because some, and some master's programs are more research focused where, you know, they're smaller and more people stay in academia. Some are more practitioner focused where they're just larger programs and you do it either as like a career switch or just a career advancement. Um, in the case where it's more career focused, I think it's okay to write statements that are more like an undergrad one, where it's just like, hey, look, I'm really, really smart and I wanna advance my career in XYZ industry, so please take me. That said, the master's is sort of in between the, mm -hmm. the PhD and the undergrad statement in that 
if you're career focused, do that. Talk about career, talk about all the hard classes you took. Um, but also, you're going to be working with a few professors. So put in a little bit of that PhD style where you're saying, oh, and by the way, I'd love to work with these two professors just on the side while I'm taking classes over the one to two years of my master's. I'd love to kind of help them with their research. It doesn't have to be nearly as in depth as a PhD one, which should, I mean, really be like a proposal. Here's all the many, many things I want to do with these professors. I've read all of their work. I think it's fine for a master's one to say, hey, look, I'm familiar with what Professor Joe is doing in this field. And I think that's fascinating. I would love to build my knowledge in that area because, you know, I want to work for IBM afterwards and they're doing similar stuff. Mm. Sounds great. Awesome. Um, cool. I guess we still have a few more questions I can read. There is one in the chat. So maybe we can, do you want to address the one in the chat, Jamie? Yeah. So how, how's the SOP structured? How should it be written? Uh, first, does one have to write about research experience or job experience or maybe about your research interests? So again, if we're talking about PhD here, um, I think job experience is not really relevant unless it's research focused. Again, because the job of a PhD in an academic, yes, you're teaching, absolutely, but your job is to produce research for the university and bring in grant funding for the university and publish. Um, so unless the job you've had is very related or research focused or in a lab, I would shy away from talking about the job experience and even downplay that if you have been working for a number of years. I would focus instead on how it, you know, you can say how this job, and actually what I did in my statement, I, I worked for a few years, those jobs made me interested in certain research topics. Although it had nothing to do with research, nothing in my field, they sparked my interest in certain areas of research, which then was the catalyst for me reading that research. So I think it's always good to tell a story or a narrative. Everyone wants to read like an interesting story, not just here are my research interests, bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. Everyone wants to read a story. Um, so I think telling that story of your life in brief, of yeah, I, I studied an undergrad and then I got a job in this area and that really made me interested in this field and I started reading research now I find myself at this point where I want to be a researcher and work with this professor. Cool. Awesome. Great. Um, let me read the next question. What is a common mistake people make while writing their SOP that one should try to avoid? Yeah, it's, it's again, focusing, thinking of it as an undergrad statement of purpose, going through and saying, you know, throughout my undergrad, I took these three classes and I got A's in them and I have reference letters from these professors saying I got an A and I'm, I'm really, really smart. Because uh, again, smart is only one component. You need, to, you need to be above the bar so that when you state your intentions of what you want to do in the research, you can convince the professor that you are the one that's able to do it based on your skills, how well you've done in courses, what school you went to, et cetera. But once you're above that bar, it's about the interests. It's about the kind of the synergies of interest between you and the professors. Um, so I would say, yeah, writing, it should look so different than anything you wrote to get into undergrad. I don't think it should necessarily maybe later on mention classes only in as much as, hey, I have experience in R and Python from this class. So, you know, I can help you in that way with data analysis and all that stuff. Or I took a stats class that taught me really advanced statistics, which is helpful for this new methodology, which I think we need to advance your research. But other than that, I think, yeah, if you read it and it sounds like your undergrad statement of purpose, you're yeah, way, way far off from what's intended. Cool. Makes sense. So this sort of, I think based on what you said, unfortunately, this might not help people that need advice right now, but maybe future listeners or people that are younger that are listening to this. It sounds that it's very, everything has to be connected to research. And I mean, so if you have research experience you can talk about, it's nice. So it's good to get involved in undergrad re undergraduate research, right? Is that, is that a good guess? Absolutely, as much as you can. And I get asked, one of the most common questions I get asked is like, I did undergrad, I've been working for eight years. Should I do a master's program? Think like, you know, cause I didn't do so well in my undergrad, let's say. Should I do a master's program where I get really good grades to then show I'm capable of a PhD? 
Um, and my answer is no, you shouldn't. If your goal is only to get good grades and show I'm smart. If your goal is to get two years of experience doing research with professors and discovering your interest and all of that, then absolutely do a master's. But if your goal is to do a master's because I didn't do as well in undergrad and so I want to get better grades, that's, that's not a good reason. If anything, you're, to show them you're smart, listen, I didn't do so well in undergrad, that's okay. Go crazy on the GRE, let's say and just, or in the Jerry subject test even, and just go for perfect scores there. It'll be cheaper and easier than doing a two-year master. So if that's your goal is just to show, listen, I had a weird undergrad experience, didn't do so well, but I nailed the GRE and the GRE subject test. Then you're good to go in terms of being smart enough. Then it comes back to maybe I need research experience. Can you get that through a master? Sure. Can you also get that maybe from just emailing a professor or some that you really like and saying, is there any help I can give you? Nights, weekends, whatever, paid, unpaid, just to get some experience to make sure this is what I wanna do. Um, that's something I did. I never ended up going through with it, but I did meet up with some professors in New York saying, just listen, I really wanna do this field. I've never studied it before, but I, can I help you in any way? And professors I found were very open to that. Yeah. Yeah, that is definitely true. Um, yeah, cool. So let me read the next question. What is the most important thing to highlight in an SOP? Yeah, so again, your, your interest, but then your capability of doing that. Because it's one thing to just, you know, be like a, a 12 year old and have read all the papers and go, I'm interested and I know exactly what you did and here's how we should bring it forward, right? Based on your future directions where anybody can do that. And that's impressive to a professor because they like that you've read their work and that you're aware of where it should go next, what their next few papers should be. But then again, the key second part is, are you the person to bring it forward? Are you capable of doing so? Because especially more senior professors they need a lot of help. They're very busy. As much as being a tenured professor seems like a really cushy life, it is quite, quite busy because you're not only doing research, but you're teaching as well, potentially multiple classes. You're reviewing papers, which is kind of always a mandate for professors, reviewing papers that other people have written for journals in your field. And you're also doing service to the university. You're sitting on multiple committees. You're working with the dean on various initiatives. So you have a lot to do when you're a tenured professor. So what you really want is that person who can come in and really help you out, really bring in new cool methodologies that you just haven't been able to learn, but this young hotshot knows R and Python or whatever, what have you, so they can bring those methodologies to you. That's fantastic. That can often hold back more senior professors. They know what's needed. They know these new methodologies, but they just don't necessarily have the time or the wherewithal to learn them, right? So if they can have a young junior person who works super hard and learns them for the professor, that's fantastic, so. Sounds great. What about this one? When schools don't give a page limit, what is the best length to stick with? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, like two pages. I don't think you need any more than two pages, uh, single spaced. That's probably, I think that's around what mine was. If you're past that, you're probably talking about too many different professors or talking too much about your past experience. And it's not really related to what research you wanna do at the university for the next five to seven years. So yeah, I'd say it really comes down to though, I don't tend to think much about page limits as much as what's needed. What do you need to say and how long did it take to say it? Because you know, if I read somebody's statement and it was two and a half pages and you just said exactly what you needed to say, I'd be like, send that out for sure. But my guess would be, I would read it and say, there's a lot of extraneous information in the middle that doesn't cut right to the point. The point again, being not to be redundant, but here's my story. This has led me to these research interests with this professor and I can help you accomplish it because of my skills and experience in X, Y, Z. Sounds good. That makes sense. Um, I don't know if you agree with this, but um, if somebody doesn't have a page limit or a word limit, that's sort of strange or uncommon, but 
if that happens, I would just email the expectations to the people that are that, you know, if somebody has like, like, a, a, like an administrator that is doing this, or, you know, somebody at the university that might know the answer, it doesn't hurt to ask, I think. Um, I would definitely suggest that. Um, I don't know. Another thing that I don't know if you agree with this, Jamie, but I've written a, 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 like a lot of fellowship, like basically grants. Um, I've seen some successful ones that are very impressive that are, they, they limit us to a page or two pages. And then they have like a subscript that say, this problem is really deep. I can't go through more of it now, but you can see my paper or my blog post and my website would have outlined everything. So if you are thinking about research and you've thought a lot about it and you have, even if it's maybe not published work, but like research plans or something like that, it could be useful. I've seen it. I've seen it in other people's candidacy for fellowships. And I was very impressed with it. They have very nice, sophisticated views on interesting topics. I don't know what you think. To include like a footnote to other things. Is yeah. That... Yeah. I've seen that in fellowships. Yeah. Um, I think it kind of goes back to that initial point about formality of the statement. And, and it leads to a question that I just saw asked uh, in the chat, which is, do you need references? I personally didn't do a reference. I don't, unless it's, if it's asking you for a statement of purpose, I believe that's saying you don't need references and all this stuff. If it's asking kind of like in the UK and some other countries, they sort of ask you for a proposal because in the UK, for example, master's degrees are split out from PhDs, right? Um, the PhD is not five years, which is like the first two years being coursework like they are here. It's instead of PhD is like three years and it's assumed that you did a research-based master's beforehand for two years. So their statements of purpose are actually more like formal proposals. Um, but if it's asking you explicitly for a statement of purpose, I do think Again, not informal in the sense of like using emojis in colloquial language, um, but I don't know that you want to include this like very formal references and here's 20 references and see my other work. I think you just, it, it should be a narrative and it should convince them quickly like, well, they know my work and they're skilled. Cool, awesome. Yeah, I think, I guess that sort of answers the question on the chat by Stephanie, if we should include, if you should include a reference section in your yeah, and don't get me wrong, I referenced a lot of papers. Um, you know, my advisor, Saul Barsaid, I said, you know, the 2017 paper, I noticed this, this, and this, um, but it didn't then have like a reference section. I think you should absolutely be referencing other work, but just I don't believe it needs to be done in a formal sense unless the program explicitly requires that because a statement of purpose is not explicitly a, a formal piece of writing, laying out a proposal of what you'll do. It's just showing your interest. Cool, let's see. Um, by Omar is asking what tips you can give us about how to express that X program is the best for me. Yeah, so primarily it's, it's the professors who are there and you show that by saying, I wanna work with these professors. Here's the reason I'm interested in what they study, their primary area of interest, which is usually like two or three broad areas that they'll have on their main faculty page. Um, so that's the best way. I wanna to go to UIUC because of Professor X and Professor Y who study this, these are my interests. Um, there is some element too of like, understanding the community of the school and what sort of programs they have, like maybe they have a weekly colloquium or something that is really appealing to you because you want to attend and even present there and get feedback on your research as you get deeper into the PhD. So I think that's, you do want to kind of tie that in at the end, not just all about professors and I'm going to work with you too and here's why. It's also like at the end, oh, and by the way, like this university is fantastic. I'd love to be a part of the community and contribute not only to the PhD community, but also the university community. I noticed that there's this program in the university that I'd love to be a part of, or this club and the weekly colloquium or weekly lunch seminars or something I'm really excited about. I think that'll ramp up my learning very quickly in the PhD. So there is sort of that one paragraph, I, I think at the end, that's like, yeah, and the, and the school is just awesome, aside from the professors. 
awesome. Let's see. Um, so yeah, I'm looking through the questions. I think we covered a lot of the things already. So I will sort of, I think like I will open it for people in right now here to ask questions. So, um, so be just, I think one last comment from Jamie, I'd like to hear, I think it's not written here, but I think it would be useful to, to hear your thoughts. So when you're writing your personal statement, your SOP, um, how do you balance, how do you, I guess like when you're writing your SOP, do you make sure you you, you write information such that it's different from your letter of recommenders? So like you're gonna submit letters of recommendation. So how do you have your statement of purpose? Supplement or complement or supplement or improve your application in general? And I don't know, do you think there might be like a risk of having things repeated? You're like in your statement and your advisor or yeah, like your letter of recommended, somebody that wrote a letter for you is repeating something you already wrote. How do you balance that? Do you just yeah. balance that by giving them your SOP before they write their letter? I think it's low risk. If anything, it just, cause think of like for the letters of reference, um, the professors that are writing them are sort of asked very specific questions or they just understand they're trying to answer very specific things because they're advisors of PhD students themselves. So they know kind of what do you need to know about this person? And it's not just, they got an A in my class. Like they know what's gonna help you be a better researcher with this PhD student. Um, so. I think if anything, if it's redundant, that's fine, right? I, but I do think they're addressing different things. You're addressing more of your interests. Like maybe the reference letter talks about some of your interests because you worked with a professor in a similar area, but that's great. And those professors are probably friends and we'll just call each other up if they're in a really specific area together, which is a great thing. Um, but I don't think if it's slightly redundant, which is all it really could be, I think that just reinforces important points. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't see that as being a huge problem. And because in general, the reference letter, the reason it's asked for is, you know, it's, it's, these professors know what's needed, as I said, for PhD students. So they're answering very specific things. Like this person is a workhorse. They're going to work at all hours. They always are bringing original ideas to class. I think they have a good mind for research and coming up with new clever ideas. It's very unique kind of a professor talking to another professor about a PhD student. Cause it's not just, yeah, they got an A in my class. Like they did well on the multiple choice test. Like that doesn't matter for research. You need an original idea and to execute on it. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think in short, there could be some overlap, but it's gonna be small and that's fine to be redundant about important things for not only me to say in my statement that I have these interests, but the professor to corroborate that um, that's that's even better, I think. Sounds great. So let me move on to one question from the chat. So Maya asks, how many words should be spent talking about the professor and their research? Like half a page, one page, etc. So I have no set limit. I, I imagine it takes kind of between half a page to one page. Uh, but yeah, if you have that much to say about the research that it takes up a page, I think I again have to like look at it and see if you're just being redundant. But if you have that much to say, like I had a lot to say about my future advisor when I was writing it, I probably said about a page about her research. I think that's awesome. Because even the ones that I coach people on, when they like force themselves to insert a paragraph about a specific professor, it, it always feels very like short and just kind of like, yeah, I read your recent paper and it was about this cool. If you have a page to say, I, I have to imagine if it's well written, that you're gonna impress them quite a bit. So um, yeah, ideally, I mean, at minimum a paragraph, at most probably you could certainly get to a page if you have really detailed ideas and you're really excited about working with them. Yeah. So I guess like tacking on that question that was asked, since it looks, sounds very important to me since most of the focus on today's conversation has been on focus on the perfect, like on the research you want to do when you go to the PhD program. Um, so do you think like giving your like future plans or what you think you could be doing for the next five years related to that research is the best thing? Like, I guess you don't want it to be superficial. 
but you also don't want it to be like, sounds crazy that it can't be done in 30 years. So I guess like a balance. I don't know what you think, Jamie. Are you saying after the PhD, Brando, your plans for? No, like if you write like about, you read, I, I'm just imagining somebody reading someone's research and being like, oh, I think we could take future steps are these, but it, those future steps might actually take for two, like a lot longer than a PhD, but you don't know. Like, it doesn't sound realistic what you're suggesting, maybe. How I think do you... that's great, honestly. So one of the yeah. questions on my qualifying exams or the comprehensive exams at the end of year two, I didn't actually have it, but as more senior student in my program had, you like, it was sort of a hypothetical. It's like, you're a tenured professor. You've been in this field for 25 years. Talk to me about your legacy and what you've done. And it was a more convoluted way of saying, talk to me about what you're planning to do over the next 25 years. It was just written in sort of a, a different way to make you get creative about it. So I think if you can acknowledge that, that this is a research program, I'm saying, this is not one paper that we're gonna finish in two to three years, but here based on your interest is the research program and the research identity, right? As they say, that I would hope to have, right? And, and recognizing and sort of, that this is not just a five-year thing. This is what I hope to develop and you and I can work on two or three papers and then I sort of go into my own identity from there. I think that's a great thing as long as you can acknowledge and show that you understand like papers take a long time to write. They're not just something you just spit out and it's done and you rewrite them a lot for R&Rs before you publish. As long as you can show you understand that. If you think you have a program of research that takes that takes you through tenure and beyond, I can't see how that wouldn't impress a professor. Um, so yeah, I, I personally love that. Cool. Omar is asking, do you think that long and short-term goals should be mentioned at the end of the SOP? So yeah, I mean, sort of, but the your long-term goal for a PhD has to be uh, being a professor and getting tenure. You know, you can't be like, you won't get accepted, right? If you are like, listen, I wanna do a PhD and then go work at Google, that would be awesome, right? That's not the point of a PhD. The point is to do research and be a professor and contribute to academia. So even if, I think a lot of times it's a loss for professors, even if you do their research in industry, if you're not publishing, they see that as like, well, that's cool. But like the point of this is to publish and contribute to academia and the body of literature. Um, so I think, I don't know if long-term goals are necessary. It's kind of should be assumed that you're, you wanna be a professor and continue on in this research program and get tenure and then train new students in the same vein in the future. And I should say too, I was meant to say for the previous question, you're writing these specific plans, right? My SOP had nothing, zero to do with what I ended up doing, 0% but it showed I was interested in the field, right? And then I was interested in this professor and I did work with this professor still, but did something wildly different. So I think that's okay. You don't have to sit there and be like, but what if this changes? Everyone recognizes it'll probably change. It could change in your fourth year, right? So recognize that you're just putting a stake in the ground here, but it's not written in stone by any means. It could change the day that you get there. You could say, oh wait, I wrote my statement about this professor. I don't even wanna work with them anymore because there's this one and I didn't even know about that research and I find that's my passion. That's totally fine, but you do need to put a stake in the ground in the SOP. Yeah, yeah. Maybe as a comment for you from, from me, I guess, based on your comment about Google, I guess, um, I don't know what you think about this, but I guess in computer science, at least, the amount of publishing that happens on industry labs is very large. It arguably, maybe some of the most influential work right now is coming from those labs. So I don't know, how do you think, do you think that, I guess, what do you think about that? I guess like in academia, like well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that researchers in like, for example, Google Brain or Google DeepMind or Adobe Research, IBM, Watson, all these people publish a lot. So maybe I guess that might apply less to CS. In CS, when you go to go, when you go to do research, in, a la in an industry lab, unless you're doing, unless you're working in my, ex in my knowledge in like um, Google X, which is like actually secret, everyone wants to publish. 
So I guess the most is that is, what do you think, I guess? Yeah, no, yeah, that's a good point. As long as you're publishing the journals that matter and you kind of get that sense early on, it's pretty yeah. explicit and in seminars, you'll learn like what an A journal, what a top journal in your field is or at your school, what they consider to be like the top five journals. Um, that is the currency, right? So yes, if you do that out of like a hut in the woods, but you're still publishing those top five journals, great. Right. If you're doing that at a university, great. If you're doing that at Google, great. But it's just that you are publishing in those outlets and contributing to the body of literature. Right. So that's what, yes. And if it's different in computer science, just in my field, in many fields, that research tends to happen from universities with grants. But in computer science, yeah, if, as long as those outlets are the same and there's a ton of funding there. And I know, yeah, like a lot of AI groups, they're they were professors and now they're in Google. Maybe they'll go back and be a professor later. It's the same outlet. So you are contributing to the body of literature, which is the goal. Great. Awesome. Cool. We have maybe two more minutes, a few more minutes, and then we're, we'll, we're, we'll be done. So let's see. Omar says, how express about my personal characteristics? I mean, I read that some people write, I am honest, good work, etc. However, I think those expressions do not have impact in a good SOP statement of purpose. So yeah, what do you think about, I guess, personal characteristics? How do you yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, Brenda. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't think there's really a place for it for things that are not verifiable, right? So if, if I just say like, I'm Jamie and like, I'm so super duper smart and hardworking. Well, like show me, how do I know that? How can I verify that? Right, so you really wanna be talking about how you verify that. You can verify that because of my grades, uh, my SAT scores and my knowledge of these computing programs and methodologies that I'm gonna use in your research. So it doesn't make much of a difference to say things that are unverifiable. Just like if you go into a bank for a mortgage and say like, I promise I have a ton of money. You know, they're like, well, show me how I can know that. So I think just saying I'm honest, like that's, you know, that's something you can't verify. So uh, what characteristics or what different things you've done in the past show that you are these characteristics and prove to me that you are these things. Yeah. What do you, th so do you think that I good? I don't know, advice I've heard is to, sh to show those characteristics through actions. Yes, exactly. Yeah, show it through your past actions, through, um, yeah, all the courses you took or how you were taking 18 credits and doing research at night, right? That like, this is your passion. You're, oh yeah, I'm passionate about research. Okay, well, how do I know that? Well, I read all of your papers and I took 20 credits and I was doing research with two professors and this publication came out of it. Yeah. Done, that's all you have to hear you're into a PhD program, that's great because you have the passion. But yeah, just saying I have passion, anybody can say that and just not have it be verifiable. Cool, yeah, awesome. Um, we'll give maybe one more minute before I guess we already opened it to sort of a discussion. It's, um, I'll just make sure everyone knows that they can ask a few more questions, um, yeah. Anyone has some la last minute questions, guys? I guess we can stay a little longer if Jamie wants or people want, but if nobody has further questions. Yeah, and you can um, connect with me on LinkedIn if you want to pass along my LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with folks and answer questions offline. I would say that a lot of the, a lot of my knowledge is on Quora. So definitely check there first and read through that thoroughly, but I'm happy to answer like specific nuanced questions that you have about your particular program or your particular interest. Yeah, definitely. His content is amazing. I actually prepared like around 20 questions just in case we ran out of questions or, or and we had extra time, but um, it seems we, we, we don't, we won't. But it seems we have one last question. So right. Bele, Belecia Benita, sorry if I said your name wrong. Um, Ask how much time should we spend talking about our past research experience? Yeah, so I think that's relevant in a few ways, right? So again, keeping that structure in mind, here's my story that led me to my interest. Here's my how my interests dovetail with the two or three professors at the school. 
here's how I can prove to you that I have the skills to complete that, what I'm saying, here's what we'll go in the future, here's how I can show you I have the skills. I think the past research applies in both the interest part and the skills part, right? You're showing like I have this interest, oh, and it came from these two projects I worked on in undergrad with these two professors, right? I, I loved it immediately. It made me more interested in that field. I read independently all of the additional work and also for that project or paper I did. And also how do you show the skills that I'm able to bring this research forward personally and with this professor is yeah, my past research experience. I was, you know, I did a full lit review. I did all the analysis. I even did the initial write up on these two projects. I think that shows you again, I have the passion, I have the interest and I have the skills and understanding of what research is so I can complete this. Oh, great. Yeah. So do you, how, how do you think like half and half a page is like, like half of the content of your SOP should be like research experience and relevance to future projects and talking about the professor's research interest and stuff like that. Do you think that's more or less a good divide? I, I mean, yeah, half and half works. If anything, I put a little more on the professor and their work and how you okay. want to bring it forward and less on here's my skills because your skills should shine through in other ways. Like it should be obvious just looking at the professors you've worked with and your resume and the projects and publications you had, it should be obvious you have the skills, but you do want to round out the SOP and like in saying, I can also do this. But I think if anything, that part is a little less than 50% and the part of really outlining I know about your interests and I want to bring them forward in this way is the unique part of the SOP that I'd rather spend more of the time on. Great. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, as Jamie said, you can connect with him if you want later on LinkedIn. Um, his core posts are amazing. I really recommend you to read them. Um, I It only took me like 10 minutes to read his top answer on SOPs to come up with 20 questions that are relevant that we cut that we pretty much covered somehow in the conversation. So yeah, thank you for, for coming. And I hope that was useful. Thanks sure. Jamie so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Brando. Hope it was helpful. And I'm around if people have more questions. Yeah. Awesome. Let me um, stop the recording and yeah.